Thank you, Your Honor. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming back on Monday, another long weekend. We have that variant out there. You've got to be so careful. Wear your masks. If you're not vaccinated, please be vaccinated right away. Drive carefully. I've noticed people are driving crazy out there. Have you noticed it? Drive defensively. Be careful. We really care about you and want you to be well. We want to see you on Monday. So do not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this case. Do not form or express any opinion on the case. Juror number two, I'll give you an update if you want to hang out a little bit longer. And uh, thank you. We'll see you on uh, see you on Monday. All right, so they're done for today. They are dark tomorrow. There'll no, be no court, but uh, on Monday, they'll pick it up where they left off, and they're actually left off in a place which is starting to get a little interesting, connecting it to Susan Berman. Again, the question, big question in this case is whether she made a call to the medical school on behalf of Kathy Durst at the behest of Robert Durst, because presumably, at least according to the prosecution's theory, he had killed Kathy Durst. And Susan Berman was about to tell authorities about 20 years later, and that's why he killed her. And now we're trying to get to the point of whether she actually made that call and whether it makes sense that she made a call to the dean of the school. Of course, Durst's claim is that she had a relationship with the dean. That's why she called him. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to take a break, quick break right now. Coming up next, we have breaking legal news about pop singer Britney Spears. And we're also covering the federal trial of Grammy Award winning singer R. Kelly. Today, one of his accusers faced some tough and revealing cross-examination in the federal sex trafficking and racketeering case against him. We'll have a live report coming up, so keep it right here on Court TV. We have breaking news about an accusation against pop star Britney Spears. Spears is now under investigation for misdemeanor battery after deputies were called to her home in Southern California. Authorities say a member of the pop star's staff says that Spears struck her during a dispute on Monday night. Now, no one was injured, but reports taken by deputies will be handed over to the prosecutor for consideration, according to the Ventura County Sheriff. Spears' attorney says that the investigation is overblown and that it involved a cell phone, but no striking. We'll, of course, keep following that story for you and keep you updated on any new developments. All right, let's turn now to R. Kelly. It is day two in the federal sex trafficking and racketeering trial of singer R. Kelly, and it brought some tough cross-examination of the prosecution's first witness in the trial. Now, Robert Sylvester Kelly is facing nine counts involving six different women. Some of them were underage at the time of the alleged offenses. Now, Kelly maintains that he's not guilty of the charges and that the victims were, in fact, fans and groupies who engaged in voluntary relationships with the superstar. And today, a key accuser returned to the witness stand to be cross-examined. Geronda Pace has told jurors that Kelly often videotaped their sexual encounters and made humiliating demands of her in a relationship that began when she was just a minor. All right, now, Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae was at that federal courthouse today in Brooklyn, New York, and she joins us now from Brooklyn. Julia, set the scene for us on day two of the trial, both inside and outside the court. Michael, here outside the courtroom, you are still seeing that strong level of support. There's a line outside in the morning of people trying to get in to make sure they can fill up those two overflow rooms because inside, we're really not able to be inside the actual courtroom. There's a heavy media presence all along the outside of the federal courthouse watching for when those attorney teams come in. When we see the defense team come in, sometimes they're in two separate groups. You have Thomas Farinella and Nicole Beck, uh, Bank, Becker Blank together walking, and then the two other attorneys on this defense team, Devereaux Canick, who we heard a lot from today, and Calvin Scholar coming in at a different time. Of course, those assistant U.S. attorneys who are presenting this case to the jury. Now, Julia, we had a little bit of breaking news from your case today. Towards the end of the day, I understand there was an issue with the juror. There was. We no longer have one of the alternate jurors who is sitting on this panel. Juror number three, as far as the alternates, uh, it's not an issue that had to do with them uh, being exposed to any pretrial publicity or anything like that. The issue is her job was not going to pay income or benefits if she continues to stay for this four-week trial. So both parties agree that she could be dismissed. So now we're looking at a jury panel of 12 jurors and only five alternates. 
All right, now, Julia, the state's first witness, uh, Geronda Pace, she continued today, and uh, she actually had to face cross-examination. How did that go? She did, and I can tell you, Geronda Pace was an extremely prepared seeming witness. She did not uh, budge. She did not seem to have any issue on cross-examination in comparison to the way she was on direct examination. She really just directly answered the questions, even owning the uncomfortable facts that she was confronted with, because she was. I mean, obviously, even just looking at her in the courtroom, she seemed like someone that you wanted to uh, feel bad for, mainly because she's sitting there pregnant, having to talk about these details from uh, 10, 20 years ago in her life. Uh, and she already, already told this jury that she is due any day. The judge urged the defendant's uh, counsel to speed it up with those cross-examination questions today. But I thought she came across very well, even though some of these uh, statements that she had to make on cross-examination uh, were likely damaging in terms of her credibility as a witness. Now, Ms. Pace, and actually many of the victims in this case, Julia, have received substantial civil settlements from Kelly, and that's something, obviously, that has to be addressed actually by both sides. So how have the prosecution and defense been dealing with this type of information? Well, the defense definitely used it to show that this is about money. That goes to one of the themes in their case, that this is about revenge and that these women who have come forward were after this singer's money. And there were even times when Deborah Kanick was doing his cross-examination. He was very smooth with it, really asking a lot of story questions of this witness. And he asked her about two of those settlements. She had several settlements that uh, she went to lawyers on, but it happened at the end of her relationship with R. Kelly, the time that she walked away from his home and decided never to return. So here's a quote from that exchange today. Uh, it, he asked her, so you were on this two-hour train ride home. You started thinking about how humiliated you were. And she said yes. And Kanick said, did you call the cops? And Pace said no. And Kanick said, but you called a civil lawyer. Pace, yes. Kanick, a civil lawyer gets you money, right? Pace, yes. This is following oh, an exchange that she said happened between Kelly and Pace, where he uh, threw her to the ground, choked her, spit on her, and then had sex with her. So it just sounded like the worst scene ever, but the defense was able to draw out that after this was over, she was interested in going to a civil lawyer. The prosecutors are using this, though, to show that this was an enterprise. All right, it looks like we're having some technical difficulties there as well. A lot of weather around the country this, this uh, uh, today, and so we look like we're having some issues with our satellite feed. So let me bring in my guest now. Hopefully uh, her feed is doing okay, and she's with me now. Uh, Department of Justice, former senior attorney and former federal prosecutor, and federal executive clemency attorney, Tammy Allison. Tammy, uh, you're here to save the day. Thanks for being on the show again. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me, Michael. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. I want to get into this Kelly case. You know, we heard um, a lot of testimony today, or uh, we were told by um, Julia that there was testimony today about these civil settlements that, uh, in particular, Geronda Pace has been involved. And we also know that a number of other victims have taken these civil settlements. Um, how do you think that plays to a jury? The idea that uh, there were some issues, there was some mistreatment, but rather than going to police, these victims actually went to civil attorneys. You know, Michael, I think it depends. And I think it depends on how the prosecution presents it. The prosecution can present it as, you know, something that was done for the victims in lieu of the victims going to uh, police and reporting a crime. And I think that the defense for Mr. Kelly can hone in on that argument, like you stated, and say, these victims are here for money. He was famous. He's popular. They want to be around him. They're groupies. And all they want to do is have his money. The defense will definitely deflect and focus on the money aspect of it. But I do think in this post Me Too movement world that people are going to understand that the time frame 
in which these alleged actions occurred, it wasn't very popular or okay or comfortable for people to go to police, especially when faced with someone with that level of fame and publicity. I think that it could be argued away that a civil attorney was probably more comfortable to discreetly do away with the issue as opposed to all of the attention that she may have gotten had she have gone to the police and brought up something that would possibly expose her and the humiliating things that happened to her. You know, Tammy, one of the arguments that the defense is making is that these um, victims were actually groupies, people who wanted to be involved with R. Kelly, and that they actually lied to him about their age. I think Geronda Pace admitted to actually having a fake ID that showed her to be 19 when she was actually just 16 years old. But the truth of the matter is, in terms of the individual acts with a minor, those things are really irrelevant. So I'm wondering, how do they play into the ultimate RICO charges and the racket racketeering and enterprise charges that he's facing. I think that it would play into it because, as we know, those RICO charges, those charges are more so the conspiracy, where one action builds on the other action. There's uh, bribery. There's things at play, not just Mr. Kelly. There are the people that work with Mr. Kelly. There are the uh, alleged victims who are feeling like they are oppressed and they're not able to speak up because of the power and the influence that Mr. Kelly has. I believe all of those things play in to the prosecution being able to meet those elements of the RICO charges to sustain that. And if the jury is believing it, the jury may convict him on those charges. Yeah, and again, I said it was irrelevant only because if, no matter what you have, if you lie about it, if a young person uh, has a fake ID, if you're under the age of 18, you cannot consent to sexual activity with an adult. Doesn't matter, again, if they used fake IDs or anything like that. All right, Tammy, Absolutely. stand by. We're going to take a quick break. Sorry about that. Um, now, as we await a verdict in the quadruple murder trial in North Dakota, it is almost time for your answers to our talkback question. Our question today was, what do you think this jury will decide in the case against Chad Isaac? We've seen a lot of evidence, 54 witnesses on behalf of the prosecution. So find Court TV on social media and answer our talk back questions. Some of your answers will be coming up next, so keep it right here on Court TV. Hello and welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. It is time now for today's Talk Back segment. Each day we post a question on Court TV's social media pages. We gather your comments and questions and then respond right here on the show. Tonight we take a look at the trial that we're covering out of Mandan, North Dakota, the quadruple murder trial in a small town. Now the jury has gone home for the night after deliber deliberating for a little over three hours or so. And they're continuing their deliberations tomorrow morning beginning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. We'll of course be covering that here on Court TV should anything happen in that courtroom. All right, that brings us to our question for today. What do you think the jury is going to decide when they continue their deliberations? Still with me is former Department of Justice senior attorney, former federal prosecutor, and federal executive clemency attorney Tammy Allison. Let's go now to our first comment. It is from Renee. She says, guilty, guilty, guilty. I don't think the defense did a good enough job to sway anyone. Way too much evidence against him. Um, Tammy, let me get your thoughts on this particular case. I haven't had a chance to check in with you on this Isaac case. Um, what are your thoughts? Do you think there is enough there to convict him, or was there a scintilla of doubt? I think there might be that scintilla of doubt, Michael. In this case, there was a lot of evidence, yes, to us, but you have to remember, the jury has jury instructions, very specific instructions to use in order to find Mr. Isaac guilty or not guilty. I think that the prosecution was kind of all over the place and getting really deep into the nitty gritty of the details with the orange sweater and the little fibers and the middle center console without really piecing it all together to create a story for the jury to see a very convincing argument that this one chiropractor is responsible for killing four different people, both with a knife stabbing and shooting when some of those victims were armed themselves. And I think that without connecting the dots and really honing in and letting the jury know exactly how he's able to do that, I think there is a scintilla of doubt or maybe even more doubt because this is one person and four individuals that are deceased. And as we saw throughout the trial, 
that video footage camera, it did not cover the entire property. So there could have been, like the defense argued, more than one player and maybe the Mr. Isaac wasn't even any of the players involved. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. And just to be clear, a scintilla of doubt, I'm not sure that reaches a reasonable doubt. I just like the word scintilla. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's move on to our next comment. It's from Sheena Marie. Man, I really thought he was not guilty. Guilty, and now I'm not so sure. The defense did a great job with reasonable doubt in their closing. Indeed. I guess we shall see. And you know what? I really believe that a lot of people feel that way. I, in following social media, a lot of people were like, I don't believe he's guilty. I don't believe he's guilty. As the case went on, then they started to think he was guilty. But again, in that closing argument, the lack of blood, the issues, it, it just all to me said, maybe he's not guilty. That part. Sheeta hit the nail on the head. It's like, it's there's a lot going on here. It's four people. And, you know, the fact that the, the there's a lot of circumstantial evidence there there wasn't really anything really, really tying him to the crime. So I agree with Sheena. Yeah, no doubt. There's that little bit of blood on the car, which is that's giving me the most problems. All right, thank you very much, Tammy. Truly appreciate you for you being with us on the show. I'm Michael Ayala. It's been a pleasure being with you as well. Coming up next in Closing Arguments, Vinnie Palatan takes a look at the biggest moment in the quadruple murder trial. So keep it right here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice.